Good morning. Happy Sunday. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed and stay, stayed safe uh, from all the snow that you got overnight. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, online this morning. I uh, will begin this morning with our call to worship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We worship the God who created us and continues to breathe life into us. Jesus lived a life without sin, yet he was crucified and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. We praise the God who gives us the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended and began to dwell in all believers. We walk by the Spirit as we continue to be made more like Christ day after day. We join together in the opening prayer this morning in unison. Almighty God, you do not leave or forsake us. You are the God of the universe and the one who defeated death and the grave. We are sealed in salvation by your Spirit, so we continue to walk in assurance of your love for us. We praise God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we will not have passing of the peace, uh, but you can take time to turn um, and greet everyone else in your household uh, as we begin for a prepare for our opening hymn, uh, which will be Oh, How I Love Jesus. <laughs> To draw your attention just to a couple of things happening, uh, you can check the website for all updated information, uh, but just for a couple of highlights here today, uh, we will be starting our new sermon series, Welcome to Church, uh, looking and studying the early church uh, through the book of Acts. We were supposed to start at the foundations of Follow Me in Sunday School today. Uh, we will simply push that back just one week, um, and so the next time that we are together, uh, in person for Sunday school, uh, we will begin this with week one. There was supposed to be a planning meeting today uh, after service for the church picnic. Uh, this meeting will now happen on January 28th uh, after Sunday school. Uh, so same time, uh, we'll just push it back to January 28th. Uh, I'll give you more announcements and reminders of this closer to time. Uh, likewise, we were supposed to kick off the new year uh, of Revive Youth tonight. Um, that is also going to be canceled because we have canceled church. Uh, so we will see your students uh, in two weeks uh, on January 21st. Next week, I uh, will be having our send-off for Pastor Larry. Uh, he did. He's no longer with us as of the new year, uh, but we do want to take time just to thank him uh, for all he has done uh, for our congregation, uh, this church. Um, and in serving the Lord. So we will have a card shower for him during moments. Um, he will be here with us uh, next week. We will have communion next week. Um, and so if you do know of a shut-in or are able to help transport one here next week, uh, please, we would love to have them to find, uh, just for one final send-off for Pastor Larry. Um, as we come to our time of prayer uh, today, just one reminder, I announced this last week, uh, but we've been updating the prayer wheel 
for 2024. Um, and so if you would like to be on that, uh, you can please notify me um, or when you are back in the church, uh, sign up for that with a phone number or an email, uh, depending on which chain you would like to be on. Uh, but we are updating that, so if you were on previous ones, uh, please make sure you are on the current one. Uh, with that, would you join me uh, in prayer this morning? God, we do thank you that as we look out um, our windows, we see the snow. Um, God, we are reminded of just your hand and beauty um, in all creation, um, and how just nature uh, and the skies display your craftsmanship. And we do just pray for safety um, as we travel, just uh, with the conditions and just some of the dangers and threats that it does bring uh, with inclement weather. But God, we do thank you that we are still able to, to gather together uh, in our homes, uh, that your spirit and your presence are with us all times, uh, that we can worship you uh, in our homes in the same way that we can being together in the church. Um, God, until we meet again, God, we just pray that uh, we remain in good health. Um, God, you know the prayer requests of our hearts. Uh, God, at this time, we normally just have the chance of the congregation to lift them up to you. But God, you do know the requests of our hearts before we even mention them. God, you know the situations where we need your presence, where we need your spirit. And God, where we need new breath breathed in. God, you know the people who need healing. And there are always situations, if it is within your will. Um, God, we pray for your miraculous power to be made known. Uh, that it just brings glory to your name. God, we do just thank you uh, that you are with us. Uh, at all times that we have your spirit, that Pentecost started the church, um, that, that we are able to call ourselves the church. And may we just go as a representation of that, God, that we are your ambassadors while we are here on earth. And God, use your spirit that has united us all together in one body. And as a result of that, God, we join together um, in the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The second hymn this morning uh, will be hymn 161, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Amen. As we come to our time of scripture reading, uh, this is normally when you do not hear my voice, uh, but we do have a special just opportunity through this month. Uh, normally we have a little bit here, uh, but the goal for the month of January um, is to have some of our shut-ins be our liturgists, uh, to just have recordings of them reading our scripture um, and to have them. And so for this morning, uh, for our scripture reading of Acts chapter 2, uh, we have Cordell Dawson. Acts 2, 1 through 6. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. 
and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud voice, everyone came running The word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. Lord, we bless you for this morning and we thank you for your faithfulness. We praise you, Father, that what you said would be will be. We see seed time and harvest, we see summer and winter. We see the beauty of the landscape outside us this morning, and we thank you, Father, that your faithfulness is just so evident. We pray for Pastor Bryant this morning for the words that you have given him by the Holy Spirit to nourish our spirits and our souls and our bodies. Give us ears to hear and minds that will, are willing to obey, and we'll give you all the praise, for you are a good God, and we do love you so. In Jesus' name, amen. And that is what we will be discussing uh, this morning. We'll be in Acts chapter 2. Um, if you are able to take your Bible out, uh, you'll have to grab a blank sheet of paper and a pen. Uh, we don't have those inserts for you, uh, but we would love for you to just follow along. I'm going to take notes this morning as we start our new sermon series, uh, Welcome to Church. Um, and to do this, we're going to start with the birth of the church, which happened at Pentecost. So this day of celebration um, is where we're going to start. Um, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 is going to be the, the primary focus. Just to understand what happened at Pentecost uh, with the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, and what I hope you really take today is understanding when Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Advocate, uh, what that really means um, and what it looks like for us to walk in the truth of the Holy Spirit. And so if we start in Acts uh, chapter 2, there's one detail that we do need to know, uh, which is found in Acts chapter 1, uh, verses 7 through 9 here. Um, and Jesus does reply to the, the disciples and the apostles here that the Father alone has the authority to set those date and times, and they are for not for you to know. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud uh, while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. Uh, so this is about ten days before Pentecost. Um, and this is when Christ has ascended into heaven. And so when we get to Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Jesus is, is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven, um, and I think that the church, the apostles, the disciples, those who were walking faithfully and following Christ, uh, were sitting with this truth of, what do we do now that he's gone? 
as he, Christ has been there, proving that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, and all of a sudden, he's gone. And that is why this, this festival of Pentecost and what happens on this day is so important to us. Uh, but what is Pentecost? Pentecost is it's a feast um, of celebration and remembrance at this time. Uh, the first verse in Acts chapter 2 here says that on the day of Pentecost, uh, all the believers were together in one place. Uh, the word Pentecost uh, literally means 50. Um, and so it would be that this feast that is being held would be 50 days after Passover. Um, and we see that in Leviticus chapter 23. Um, it is talking about a feast of the weeks, or also called the Feast of the Harvest. Um, and that from the day after the Sabbath, the day you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, count off seven full weeks. And then on the 50th day, there would be a feast um, to celebrate the grain harvest, and then we celebrate Pentecost now uh, 50 days after Easter. Um, and so Pentecost is our remembrance of 50 days after the resurrection. Um, and so being in 50 days, Christ was resurrected uh, on the earth for 40 days. Um, and on the 40th day, he ascended into heaven. Uh, Pentecost is the 50th day. And so the celebration takes place about 10 days um, after, after the ascension of Christ. But we get these, these signs that define Pentecost. Um, in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 2 and 3 here, But suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then it looked like flames of tongue, flames or tongues of fire, uh, appeared and settled on each of them. Uh, what is happening in, in this, at Pentecost, we're going to get the, the visual, the non-visual, and really the auditory sounds that define the presence of God. Um, Jesus talks about the wind um, in different places where we can't see the wind. Um, it is this non-visual effect that we feel. We, we see the effects of wind um, in, in nature, but it's, I would say, impossible to see wind um, itself. So we get this non-visual sign. Fire, uh, we can all see fire. Uh, it is this visual presence of God that we also get. Um, and tongues is going to be this new language uh, birthed by the Holy Spirit that between the three of these, uh, it is speaking into almost all of our Senses with visual, non-visual, um, and then auditory signs of what is happening at Pentecost. Um, if you really get to this more, um, specifically why these three signs um, are given to define the coming of the Holy Spirit. Right, so we have those three signs, and these three signs are given to a worldwide audience. I were told that at that time there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. Um, if you go ahead and skip a couple of verses um, towards that later part there, um, in Acts chapter 2, um, in verses 10, or starting in verses 7, um, and then going through 11, uh, these people are completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaim. Uh, these people are all, all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. And here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya, um, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, uh, both Jews and converts to Ju Judaism, uh, Cretans, and Arabs. If you need something to do, go ahead and read that passage again out loud. But uh, the point that we're really supposed to get here is, is what is happening at Pentecost is not um, an Israelite experience is not an experience just for the people of the country of Israel. Uh, that is so much of what we've been talking about in the last couple sermons and the sermon series is, is that the gospel is truly for all people. Um, that the death and resurrection of Christ is available to Jews and Gentiles alike. And the same thing here that we're going to see at Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
is it's worldwide. It is for all believers of all nations, um, if we are willing to believe. Um, I will say that the last piece of, of Pentecost is the most important. Um, it is the, the simple fact that the Holy Spirit is poured out onto the people. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, um, and they began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And we're going to look at here very soon about what does the Holy Spirit do. Um, if you are familiar with this idea of the Trinity, of it God being a triune God that we see through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Um, and so in the same way in which we have been given the Son, we have now been given the Holy Spirit. And so that is why Pentecost is so important, that it is, once again, God coming to be with us, this time permanently as believers. Right, but it is important to note that the Holy Spirit is poured out, and this is not just something that happens. Um, I hope through the, the Christmas series that you saw all of the prophecies that we talked about, that the coming of Jesus and who Jesus would be was not just a random accident. Uh, many times the, the very details were prophesied about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before they happened. The same is true with the Holy Spirit. Um, in Isaiah chapter 32, uh, we get the Lord speaking this word through the prophet Isaiah, that the palace and the city will be deserted. Um, it goes on to talk more in this instance about the, like how lost, how unfruitful, how hopeless uh, the nation is at this time. Um, and God then says, this will be for the city until the Spirit is poured out from heaven. That it is that one day, God is going to pour His Spirit out on the people. Um, and this righteousness, this Spirit is going to bring peace. It will bring quietness and confidence forever. Um, and this is the, the quietness, the confidence, and the peace because the Holy Spirit will reveal everything that we need to know about the Father um, and God Himself who is all of these things. Right, so the Pentecost is not a random accident of an event that just so happened to be. It was something prophesied about a long, long time ago. Uh, we also get it in Joel chapter 2. Um, in verses 28 to 32, it talks about this outpouring of the Spirit where God again uh, will pour out His Spirit upon all people. Uh, we are reading Acts chapter 2, 1 through 13 uh, this morning. If you keep reading um, until you get to verse 16, when Peter addresses the crowd, uh, he actually quotes the very prophecy found in Joel about this, this very idea that what you just saw was not an accident. Um, that like we have the prophecy and you know the scriptures that God said he was going to do it and he would do it. And so if we have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? I of the Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit is the hardest one to wrap our heads around um, with what it does, and I'm hoping to help you do that uh, today a little bit. So we're going to look at what are some of the works of the Holy Spirit. Uh, what does the Holy Spirit do uh, for us and on our behalf? The first and the most important, uh, that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, meaning it comes into and resides in the believer. And it seals the believer um, as a guarantee of salvation. Uh, many, many times, uh, Jesus and, and some of the disciples and uh, the apostles and those that write talk about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. What the heck does that mean? And John, uh, Jesus, in John chapter 3, before the famous words of John 3.16, that he says to Nicodemus, um, in verse 5, I assure you that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Uh, we need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. Right, John the Baptist, uh, we get his words here in Mark chapter 1, 
uh, telling of the coming of Jesus says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If we keep reading Scripture, we begin to get... We, we start to see the importance of this, and also, I think, what this kind of means. That Peter is talking here later in Acts chapter 2, um, in verse 38 there, and commands and basically charges the people and says, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to that very soon is, is how the Holy Spirit is the manifestation of the presence of God. Um, and so to be baptized with the Holy Spirit is to receive God himself. We receive the Holy Spirit objectively in the same way as we receive Christ as our Savior. It is objective truth of what happens when we believe. The indwelling and the reception of the Holy Spirit happens the moment that you say yes to Jesus. That's why these things go together, as Peter says here, with the repentance of the sin, that if we are baptized then in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, right, it is at that moment of which we believe and profess in Christ um, as the Messiah, as the, our personal Savior and His Lord, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I put it in, in Galatians chapter 3 and talking about this almost the same concept. And he says, I ask you again, and he's pleading with the, the church in Galatia, right, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message that you heard about Christ. There is nothing you can do to earn the Holy Spirit. Uh, your reception of the Holy Spirit has everything to do with because of what Christ has done. In the same way that we receive the gift of salvation as a free gift, what we receive, part of that salvation is receiving the Holy Spirit. So to be baptized by the Holy Spirit is to believe in Christ and receive the gift of salvation that is the good news. It is the same way in which we receive Jesus Christ as Savior of the world. I mean, that is what it is to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. The indwelling is so very, very important. Because not only is it God living in us, but this idea that it, it seals us. We, as human beings, Doubt. Right, when we don't feel it, we begin to doubt the genuineness, the reality of our faith. And Satan takes that and twists it and beats us down, I think, until the point of sometimes we go, Am I really saved? Why receiving the Holy Spirit is so important is because it seals you for eternity. The reception of the Holy Spirit is how you can have your guarantee. Uh, many commentaries will call the Holy Spirit and, and his action at Pentecost as the down payment for salvation. In Romans 8, uh, Paul writes that his spirit joins our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. It is God's spirit, the Holy Spirit, being poured out and indwelling in us, that it joins our spirit of existence. Why? The point of that is to affirm that we are God's children. Paul writes again in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 that he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. We can have confidence in our faith and our salvation because of the Holy Spirit. That God sent His Son in Jesus because we needed saved. And I think that like, God knows the human mind and the human heart and how we process that He gives us the Holy Spirit because I think at some point He knew we were going to doubt. At some point we were going to fall short. At some point we were going to have this temptation to turn and question everything. And yet it, that's, that's what birthed the, the church. Right, that God gives us the Holy Spirit in the same way that He gave us His Son so that we can have full confidence. That when we have the Holy Spirit, we're, we have this objective truth that affirms we're God's children and God identifies us as His own 
through that. It is our installment that guarantees everything. At the first work, and the, the most objective truth of it is that the Holy Spirit indwells us um, and seals us for eternity. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is the one that brings revelation to us, to the believers. That we're here, uh, we talk, I preach and teach to you, uh, you go and, and talk to others, you pray, you read scripture, it's really only by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that we can do those things. That the Holy Spirit is the one that, that reveals the things to us that we need to know. And this happens in, in many different ways. Um, in Second Peter, and we talked about this a little bit last week with the prophecy of Simeon, I um, mean, what is a prophet and how does God use the prophets? Um, it's through the Holy Spirit that he speaks um, and inspires the words that are written uh, to them. And it's so that these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. At the last half of the Old Testament or so is the book of the prophets. Um, the books from the prophets and they're moved by the Holy Spirit. It is revealed what is the word of God um, that they are to write. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will reveal and begin to lead and move people themselves. Um, last week with Simeon, we talked and, and looked at how it was the Spirit of God that led Simeon into the temple that day, uh, which happened to be the day that Mary and Joseph were bringing Jesus. Um, in Mark chapter 1, we're told that the Spirit compels Jesus to go into the wilderness. Um, and this is for the 40 days uh, that which Jesus would be in the wilderness and tempted. It is the Spirit that leads Jesus into that. Right, so it reveals what we need to know, the words from God. It reveals where we're supposed to go and leads us. Uh, but I think the most important idea in this revelation is that it just teaches us and reveals everything we need to know about God himself. Right, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have received God's Spirit so we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given to us. Like the Holy Spirit is God. I mean, in the same way that, that I've, I've pleaded with you, of, if you just follow the word of God, and you follow the example of Jesus and the words of Jesus, it's going to lead you right to the presence of God. The same is true with the Holy Spirit. We've received the Spirit so we can simply just know the things that God has given to us that we can know God himself, that we can know God the Son, and it's through God the Holy Spirit. Now in Ephesians chapter 2, verses, uh, verse 18 here, it says, All of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. If you look at this, you have Father, you have Son, and you have Holy Spirit. Uh, to very simply um, try and explain how the Trinity works to you, um, with the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I think, I think what Paul writes here um, is a pretty good summary of that that gives it to us and how they all work together. That in that we come to the Father through the Spirit because of the Son. And so when we think about how do we pray and, and really what that process looks like, like we lift our prayers to God the Father. We pray them through the Holy Spirit, and we have that access because of the work that Christ has done for us. They all serve themselves, and they all serve one another, and it's so that we can know all of them. And through the Father, through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, we have God. And it's all revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. The third work here is that the Holy Spirit sanctifies the believer. That sanctification is your oreo. Um, if you can recall that, maybe you still have some at home. Eat one after this sermon. Um, enjoy it. Uh, that process off of uh, what salvation is, um, and that the middle part of that oreo, the good part, um, is the sanctification. Um, and sanctification is a very fancy word to simply mean you are purified, and you simply just become more like Christ. And this is what the Holy Spirit is here to do. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we are encouraged that we were 
cleansed, we were made holy and we were made right by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We are made right with God through the justification of Christ, but we are made holy and we are cleansed because of the work of the Spirit. It is written in Titus that he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that produces the change, the sanctifying in our lives. At this side, this work of the Holy Spirit is new life. And it's this idea that we have committed ourselves to Christ, that our purpose is now to grow and become more like Christ. Right, to purify ourselves, to rid ourselves of sin, to change our mind, to walk a new direction. And that is the work. But we have to come to this reality of why this is so hard and so important for us. Uh, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, he says, Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Right, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And these two forces are constantly fighting each other. We are in spiritual warfare. Like, it is a battle between truly living through the Spirit and what God wants us to do, and this urge to just follow what we really want to do. And we have to at least acknowledge the fact that our nature and God's nature are contrary to one another because of sin. And that is why, as, as Paul writes this, every time he talks about the, the human nature, he calls it sinful nature. Right? Because our nature is not is fighting against the nature of God. And so to receive the Holy Spirit and to be guided by the Holy Spirit is to be ridden of these things and to move more into what it really looks like to be like Jesus. This is the long process that, that happens, and it's painful because it's ridding ourselves of what our heart really desires, but it is to become more like Christ and to actually begin to, to deepen our understanding of what it means, like who God is as a just presence and as a God of the universe, but also really through our nature of, of who Jesus was. Right, so the Holy Spirit indwells and seals the believer. He reveals to the believer. He sanctifies the believer. And it's corporately, well, it is the Holy Spirit that unifies all believers. Like the human body has many, many parts. But these many parts make up one whole body. Uh, you are one person in one body with a lot of different appendages and bones and muscles and, and parts. It is the same way with the church, the body of Christ. Uh, the Greek word is ecclesia, it's assembly or fellowship, but there are so many parts to us, but really we're just making one body, uh, one program, one church for Christ. Why do we claim this? Right, Paul answers this because we've been all baptized into one body by one spirit, and we share the same spirit. Uh, this is the, like, the truest image of we're all in the same boat. Uh, as humankind, we have been separated from God because of sin. As one body and one people group, we're all in the same boat of we need the salvation that only comes through Christ. And if we are willing to accept that and receive that gift, then we all are in the same boat as the church. It is a multinational multi-ethnic group of believers, of all believers, for all time. In Ephesians chapter 1, that we're told that Christ is made the head over all things for the benefit of the church. It does us good and does us better, and it is for our benefit to have Christ at the head of everything. That is true for the church as a, as a global body that is absolutely true for the local church, and I promise you it's true for you as an individual believer. Right, to have Christ at the head is for your benefit. Why? Well, because we are made full and complete by Christ. It is this church, it is the one body of believers that is the bride of Christ, and that he is returning for. To sum this up, um, and what this really means, um, is the fifth point here, that 
The Holy Spirit is the primary manifestation of God. That means it is the primary presence of God that we have now. Uh, we, we've talked about God the, the Father, um, that is just the God that we have um, and that we pray to and that does these works. It is the creator of the universe. We have Jesus the Son who becomes the incarnation of God. That's what Christmas is for. Right, that we begin to understand and we can read the Gospels and, un- and just look at and receive this is God in the flesh. Christ has ascended. Like, when the believers sit there and go, now what do we do? The Holy Spirit is that answer. What do we do without Jesus? We worship through the Holy Spirit. It is now the presence of God that is not only with them, but it indwells them, and, it, and it's also with them for eternity. If we read the, the Old Testament, that it is the Spirit coming, descending upon someone for a specific purpose, and then many times the Spirit leaves. Like David writes one of the, one of the Psalms about like the, these plea with God of, please do not take your Spirit from me. Like the Holy Spirit being the primary manifestation of God is quite literally God being with us. Now we talked about Christmas with Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. That's the Holy Spirit. It's all so we know that God is with us every step of the way. Uh, because he is God, the Holy Spirit is God himself. But Matthew 28, 19, it's part of the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are of all equal importance and all equal pieces um, and persons of God. As Jesus says in John chapter 14, right, Jesus, the Son, will ask to the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. Uh, this would have spoken to the disciples, it would have smacked them right in the face, of understanding that the Spirit of God comes, performs a work through a specific person or in a specific person, and then would leave until the next time. But now the advocate that is coming because of the Son and through the Father, that is going to be God himself, it's going to be the advocate who will be the Holy Spirit, and it's going to lead you into all truth. The primary manifestation of God will lead you right into the presence of God. It's good. It's good news. But we do have these very specific verses in Matthew chapter 12 where we're told that every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. You may have heard these verses and ask yourself the very simple question of, what does this mean? And what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? If we take uh, this in the context of the conversation that Jesus is having with the Pharisees, uh, we get this idea. Um, the Pharisees at this time, in this conversation, when Jesus rebuttals with this, they're, they're taking the work of the Spirit in Christ and attributing it essentially to Satan. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to attribute the work of the Spirit to the devil, essentially. Um, and so what Jesus is speaking of here is to, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And what um, the Pharisees are doing is basically saying that Jesus is demon-possessed, that the Spirit inside him is demonic, and it is not the Spirit of God. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is it the one sin that can't be forgiven? It's because it's literally God himself. But that it is the primary manifestation of God after Pentecost. And that we come to understand it as God. And so to remove one part of that is to not understand and love God completely. Right, those are the works of the Holy Spirit. If we understand that, we can move into going back to Acts chapter 2, where we get the signs of, of the wind, the fire, and the tongues. 
and why those three specifically um, are given to the Holy Spirit. First, we get the wind. By Acts chapter 2, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. That wind, the roar of God, is everything that represents creation and light through the Spirit. Right, in Genesis 1 1 um, and Genesis 2 7, our two creation narratives, or just Genesis 1 2, not Genesis 1 1. But it's the Spirit of God that is hovering over the surface of the waters. It is part of, it's the root of Elohim that is there as part of creation. Right, in Genesis 2 7, that God forms Adam from the dust and breathes the breath of life, the root of into the man's nostrils. At the wind, the breath, the Spirit of God, and it's all the same word in Hebrew. It is the creation of life through the Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit, we get it, the Spirit of God is the one that literally breathed creation into existence and then breathed the creation of you and I into existence. The creation of man. But if we read the psalm in Psalm 104, I, it's put so plainly that God, when you give them your breath, life is created. When the Spirit from God comes, the only choice of what is about to happen is life. And in the same way, we see in the book of Job that if God were to take his Spirit back, you and I are done. That all life would cease, humanity would turn again to dust. The spirit that was breathed into death formed man, and if that spirit is taken away, we're simply going to return again to dust. And so this first idea that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, being wind, that there's a windstorm, that it speaks to this image of life and creation, this new life that is coming through the Spirit. Secondly, we get fire. Or it looks like tongues of fire. And this represents purification, right? The sanctification that is going to come through the Spirit. It will look like flames or tongues of fire appeared on them and settled on each of them. But if the Spirit is bringing about new life, there's, there's plenty of biblical examples of this. Jesus talks about new life being baptized by the Spirit. But what I want to take you back to is Exodus chapter 19. Um, and Moses is on Mount Sinai. And then all of Mount Sinai is covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. Right? That the Spirit and the presence of God is then represented by fire. But if you flip to Exodus 19, you go on the same page in your Bible depending on how it's laid out. Exodus 20 is the giving of the Ten Commandments on the tablets. And so it is, God seals his promises and he seals these covenants with fire. Now, that is why in the temple the Lord would come in the presence of fire. He led them with pillars of fire. He led the Israelite people. And so if God is, if he seals his covenants and promises to the people with fire, the Holy Spirit has been promised. Like the Son, the Messiah was promised. It's, it's God, like, being faithful to his word. If he said it will be, it will be, and he's doing it. But... The fire that is coming is going to establish the new life and the new covenant through Christ. All right, because once again, we get these words from John the Baptist. Right, it's now in the Gospel of Matthew. Right, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's going to be purification that's going to come, but that purification is going to establish the covenant of God with the people of God. The last one is this presence of tongues, um, specifically the language. Right, everyone was present, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. The presence of tongues here, it, it leads us back to the unification of all believers through the Spirit. How is that possible considering they're still hearing different languages because it's a lot of people from a lot of different places in the world? 
if we are willing to go back the whole way to Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. Like the people are trying to build a city essentially to get to heaven without God. And in 11, Genesis 11, 6 through 9, like the people, God is talking to people are united because they speak the same language. Right? At this point, there, there's one language. Everybody speaks the same language, so they all understand each other. Right? That's why they're working together to build the city that's going to resemble heaven, to get to heaven without honoring God. They're going to do it themselves. And so God says, come on, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world. Right? They scattered because they don't understand each other anymore. They stop building the city because they can't work together, because they can't tell the same story. That is why the city is called Babel, because that is why the Lord confused the people with different languages. To flip back to Acts chapter 2. Like the people are scattered all over the world and separated from each other. They're all divided because of language. And we still experience this how many thousands of years later that people were divided by culture, were divided by language, were divided because we simply just can't understand each other. And so when it is the, the, the Spirit of God, the presence of God that has scattered the people all over the world because of language, why would it not be the image of the Spirit of God that is then going to join the people all back together with only like the divine language that is tongue? Like they're all coming together because they're, they're speaking, they're hearing their own language, but it's telling one miraculous story. That it was language that separated and scattered the people because they couldn't talk to each other. And now we're gathering the people at Pentecost with a new language, a language that only comes from knowing the Holy Spirit of God that we are all unified through one spirit, and we are now sent to tell one story. The Holy Spirit, the mark of the Holy Spirit, is the mark of an eternal God, the Catholic Church, and of individual believers. Now, the Holy Spirit is the mark of God himself. We, we talked about it being the primary manifestation of God. It is God Himself. It is the mark that unifies us all together. Now, if we say the Apostles' Creed every week, uh, we use the I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Right? We're not talking about the capital C Roman Catholic Church. Right? The Catholic Church is the universal church defined by the reception and having the Holy Spirit. Right? So when we say that in the Apostles' Creed, we're saying we believe in the church that is defined by the Holy Spirit. That it is the Holy Spirit that is the mark of the universal, the Catholic church. And then it is the mark of the individual believer. That it is the grace, and the grace of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, right, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That they all are marks of the presence of the eternal God. And we receive the the Spirit, right, we take all these tests and do all these studies to figure out what our spiritual gifts are. Right, in 1 Corinthians 12, I'm going to couple of the verses, right, to put this all together, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. It is a one and only Spirit um, who distributes all of these gifts. We've been baptized into one body by one Spirit. Right, they're called spiritual gifts because they come from the Spirit. Right, and it's a mark of having the Spirit in us that, that really, if we're, we really think about this, our spiritual gifts, yes, they're about our talents, but I think sometimes we take this in a step further of, well, I'm going to know my spiritual gifts and then I can only get involved in what makes me comfortable and to grow my faith. Your spiritual gift is not necessarily about you. And it, your spiritual gift is what is given to you as a mark of the Holy Spirit. So then use whatever that gift is to glorify the Lord. That is the purpose of spiritual gifts. It's more to be a mark of the church and the mark of God than it is to see how good we are at something. 
but to really be a mark of the individual believer. Right? Because we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of believing. I point out in Romans chapter 8 that we are controlled by the Spirit. Um, and if you have the Spirit of God living in you, I remember, th- this is like the, the caveat to this, this is the key point, right? that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. Right? The words that Jesus speaks in John chapter 14 where He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. If we can't know the Father without knowing Jesus, but if we don't have the Spirit, we don't have Jesus. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we don't have anything. We don't have Jesus. We don't have God. We've got nothing. And so the Holy Spirit is the telling, the talk, like the, the all and all be all mark of have you placed your faith in Christ? Because they go one and the same. If you've received the gift and salvation of Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit. And there is good news in Pentecost. Uh, this is why these, these marks, these images, are why not only Pentecost breathes the like, life into the church, it is the foundational piece that establishes the church and the body of believers. It's God doing the impossible and rewriting history forever. And after 400 years of silence of where did God go, God speaks again, and then he brings his son, Jesus Emmanuel, we just celebrated Christmas, but for God to be with us. But as we start the new year, and I think sometimes we still just go, well, where is he? I think some of these believers had to have the same question of like, when Jesus goes, like, now what do we do? And the first mark that Jesus does is sitting at the throne but the right hand of God the Father is to give you the same spirit that raised him from the dead. That like God dwells in us and with us. Yes, he is God with us. But the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that it is an absolute fullness. And what I mean by this is God gave you everything that he had. By Romans chapter 8, by verse 11, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That the Spirit that God gave you, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that indwelt the believers, is the same one that raised Jesus from the dead. But He can't give you anything better than that. He's given us the fullness of His presence, the fullness of hope and belief. And in Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, the, the fruit of the Spirit, we talked about spiritual gifts, that when the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. They're produced by the Holy Spirit. But to, we can only know those things by knowing God, and we have to have the Holy Spirit to really know God. It leads us straight to God, because if you want to know love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control... Like, they are God himself. And he didn't restrict any of it from us. He didn't give us a lesser spirit. He didn't give us half of who he is. But that's why Jesus, like, fully God came to us, and as fully man died on the cross. Because God gave us everything. He gave us his one and only son. He gave us the one spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Give us the one spirit that has defeated death, and it's the same spirit that produces everything that we wish to have and that we seek for in life. But God gave us everything that he had in fullness, only so that we might stop and consider giving him our fullness, the fullness of our life to return to him. I do not in first John 4 that God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. I all who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. It's a two way street. And the Holy Spirit is that. That not only is it God coming to be with us, it is what allows us to get to God because of what Christ has done. The Spirit is proof. Pentecost is proof. That God desires to be with you and has given everything and all fullness to you. If we're willing to answer him 
and Pentecost is the answer to the impossible. Right? At the end, after hearing all of the languages spoken, everyone speaking and hearing their own language from a group of people that can't actually speak those languages. Now, what happens with, with tongues is, is most of us hopefully all know English. We don't really know any other languages. Most of us are not bilingual. Just like these people. Most of these people are probably not bi or trilingual in the way of what is about to happen. And when the Holy Spirit comes out, they're speaking languages that they don't even know. And yet each person from all those different people groups of the worldwide audience is hearing their own language. Because we're unified to answer to the impossible of what God actually just did. Because Pentecost, the miracle of Pentecost is the impossibility of really what is happening. Not only is God out, like, outpouring the Holy Spirit, but He's doing things that are humanly impossible to us. And we can't just wake up and start speaking a new language. And what happens is the people stand there, they're amazed and perplexed, and they begin to ask this question, what can this mean? So at first Peter, in chapter 3, Peter writes, right, we must worship Christ as Lord of our life. And if somebody asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to give an answer. An answer to the impossible measure and the impossible power of God. Right? It's written in Ephesians chapter 3, like to the God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever bring, like, a wrap our head around. Like, that is Pentecost. The foundation of the church is the impossible. The foundation of your faith is the impossible, that God broke through heaven to be with you, right? that he died on a cross, they buried him in a grave, and the impossible happened again when the tomb became empty. Now, we get beaten down a lot that we are impossible. It's impossible for God to save us. It's impossible for us to turn our lives around. God choosing me is simply impossible. Pentecost is the rebuttal to that argument. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is God saying it don't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what nation you come from, what your past, where you have traveled from, where you find yourself right now. Those who are simply there experience the impossible. If we're ready to answer to that. We've received the gift of salvation. We've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are called to give our testimony to express and explain why we have hope. And my charge to you is, is can we live in a way that through the Holy Spirit that has changed us, has really given us new life, that we live that to the fullest, that someone looks at us as the corporate body, that the, the universal church, that the local church here at Stone Paul, but us as individual believers, that we begin to be so changed that people look and go, what can this mean? Which is why these two questions are so important. Like, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? It is the one question that, that matters. It's the same way as how do you receive Jesus? It's the same question. Right? Because they come together. And if we have, are we walking in that? But are we living a life that is, what can this mean? Right, and there's two sides of that question. Of the people who are wondering, asking, what can this mean? What is this whole God, what is this whole Jesus thing about? Pentecost answers that. It's about God doing the impossible and giving everything that he has for your salvation. For you to dwell with him. Like the Lord wants to be in a relationship with us and he has withheld nothing to make that happen. If we are willing to repent of our sin, to believe that he is Lord, to profess that that grave is empty, right, we will be saved. We're justified with Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit and allow that to guide our lives. And join me in prayer this morning. God, I thank you for your spirit. God, I thank you that you are the God of the impossible. And sometimes just when we ask this question of what do we do now? Where do we go from here? Is it really all over? You just outpour your love. You outpour your spirit. 
to just remind us that you are still working and you give us that seal of not only are we yours now, but we are yours for eternity. God, in these moments of, of Pentecost and <laughs> the, with the world watching, you show up and do what only you can do. And it changes lives forever. God, may we go just simply knowing that Pentecost is the impossible event of your working that changes lives forever. And may we begin to experience that. That the outpouring of your Holy Spirit leads us directly to you. God, it reveals who you are to us. It reveals everything that you have freely given to us. It reveals us that, that you are eternal, God, that we are in this together, and that you so desperately want to have a relationship with us. God, I, I praise you simply because you have given us everything in fullness. God, very rarely do we actually even give ourselves in fullness to anything, to anything, to anyone. We give bits and pieces, but rarely do we give it all. And yet every moment that you can be with us, God, you just give us everything that we need. You give us the gifts to serve you. You gave us your one and only Son. You give us the fruit of the Spirit and everything that we desire to uphold us, to strengthen us. You renew us in complete fullness. You gave us the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, even though he is worthy of it and we are just not. And may, because of that very simple fact, God, may we place our faith, our hope, our trust in you. And that when someone asks, what is your life? What can cause this? We are ready to give an answer to you. God, if we don't know what to say, God, Jesus encourages the disciples of, just don't worry, in that time the Holy Spirit will give you what to say. But you leave us with an advocate who will never leave us. And God, if we don't know what to say, you've given us so much that we have the words of the Apostles' Creed. God, we join together in that profession now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our final hymn uh, will be hymn 457, Take Time to Be Holy. with the encouragement that Paul writes in Romans chapter 15, that the Spirit of hope fills us completely, and that we go with the confidence in the Holy Spirit. 
May you grow in the true blessing and the love and the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.